how does the booking for battle royals go? Is it a team of agents who put the match together or one? A lot of these spots look well put together, so they all can happen on a whim. Has Jim Cornette been responsible for one of these during his WWE tenure? And I wonder, not, if, he, I wonder if he means Royal Rumble, just based on the fact that one just happened, but well, he said it, Battle Royal. We'll cover both. Um, and Pat Patterson is usually the guy, I mean, it, it, I, I don't even know now if Pat even goes to the shows, but Pat Patterson always was the guy. He invented the Royal Rumble, and he was always the guy to put the Royal Rumble together. And he would sit down, and he would put thought into it. And he would know what guys Vince wanted to feature. And, even you know, it, it, if a guy is not going to win, but I want to make him look good in a spot, and I want it to, you know, make a, an impact. Um, or here's some fodder for you. I don't care what this guy looks like, but Pat would be the guy. And he invented the Royal Rumble because he had seen the success of the Battle Royals in San Francisco with Roy Shire when he was top guy out there. And he just put a twist on the Battle Royal to have people enter every two minutes to build it and make it more exciting. Um, but in Battle Royals, it, it depends. And I've never did a, a Battle Royal or a Royal Rumble in the WWF. Uh, but I've done them, and it depends on the situation. Uh, battle Royals are almost old as the hills in wrestling. The first show that I ever went to live, I got my mom to promise me she would never take me, and I said, oh, but if they have one of those Battle Royals, we, okay, Jimmy. Well, luckily, in Tennessee, they had a Battle Royal, seemed like every fucking three weeks. So the next time they had a Battle Royal, it wasn't too long, and I got to go. Um, but it, it, sometimes it was a spot show thing. You've got a, a tag team match with four guys and you've got two singles matches with four guys so have an eight man battle roll and you don't have to pay anybody twice. Um, or it could be a main event on a major show like they used to do with San Francisco and you would, you would organize it or budget for it accordingly. If it's a spot show battle Royal, eight, 10, 12, 14 guys, whatever you just tell the referee, okay the last two or three guys need to be these two heels and a baby face and, and, uh, uh, somewhere or another, let's do this and that. And the other thing to get the baby face over and send the people happy, everybody else pick your spot. And it, the guys would just do it in the ring. Nobody would know. Cause it was a big schmoz. Anyway, there was what we called the Titanic battle Royals. That's where everybody dove over at the same time. I, one time Eddie Marlin in Tupelo, which everybody hated working in Tupelo. Eddie Marlin's the ring announcer and the promoter, so he's got to not only announce the match and ring the bell, but then run to the front window and check up the tickets while the match is going on, right? <laughs> he fucking rings the bell to start the, the 12-man battle royal, and he turns around and he walks 50 feet to the front door, sit down at the table, and he hears the bell ring, and the fucking guy's won already. <laughs> That's the Titanic battle royal. Everybody just bails all at the same time. Um... <laughs> But if it was a major town, you would put more thought into it. You would say, hey, and during this thing, let's have a spot between so-and-so and such-and-such, -and, -such, and maybe let's do this. And and maybe you were shooting an angle out of the finish. So after everybody else got uh, fucking dumped, the last two or three guys in there would go a while and set something up. Or in the old days, in the 70s, when they invented the two-ring battle royal, which – I don't know if it started in Tennessee, but they did it very early, but they also did them in, in Minneapolis and AWA and places, but they'd have a, a battle royal go on in each ring, and the last guy in ring one would fight the last guy in ring two in a regular singles match for the whole thing. And Tennessee changed it where everybody would start in ring one and you'd be eliminated by thrown by being thrown over the top rope into ring two, which was side by side. And then you'd be eliminated for good by being thrown out of that ring. And then the last two guys would fight. Um, those things were just chaos. I mean, they used to have 30 man, you know, uh, battle royals with those things. They had the 50 man battle royal when, when Jerry Jarrett talked to Eddie Marlin into building that 30 by 30 foot ring out of fucking lumber. And it was hard as a rock, but they used it in Memphis and in Lexington drew houses on the world's largest battle royal, 50 guys. And again, it was, you know, 20 local fucking outlaw guys and everybody that they had in the territory and a couple of special guests. And I guarantee you, they told everybody, just pick your spot or we'll pick it for you until they got down to the last three or four. I've done some on television, including in OVW and for Smoky Mountain Wrestling, 
where since it was TV and we wanted to make specific points and get specific guys over and have specific guys make an impression in a allotted amount of time, then I sat down and worked it out and we told the guys step by step, you know, here's what we'd like to see, you know, basically the, not step by step, but the structure of it. And then they're still doing a lot of their own shit. Bobby Eaton used to have a deal in battle Royals where if he got a, just a good natured, this is a good rib, right? This doesn't hurt anybody's fucking property or anybody damage anybody's career or hurt their standing in the eyes of their, you know, Confederates, right? Bobby would tell a green guy to get a headlock on him in a battle Royal. And then like, imagine if there's 14 other guys in the ring and this guy's got a headlock on Bobby and Bobby starts to shoot him off and says one tackle, drop down, get it again and shoots <laughs> him off in a battle. Royale. So the guy's running toward the ropes, but he's going, stop and pardon me, step aside, excuse me, step aside, pardon me, step aside, excuse me, step aside, hits the ropes when he's starting to come back. He sees Bobby's not even there, right? He's gone. He's walked away from it. But that, you know, it, 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 they were very uncontrolled probably the loosest most ad lib kind of match and the guys would either take it seriously or and may and it would be good or they would ass off because it was an added spot show match and nobody gave a shit and it would stink and that's where you would in those days come the closest to seeing some town killing shit go on <laughs> but and and i used to I, when i first got into business i worked in a million battle royals every night when i was on the spot show run in tennessee i'd be in the battle royal too so at least to get somehow to get it over a little bit and i didn't invent this i'd seen it done before jimmy hart had done it but he wasn't the first one either but as as the heels were coming to the ring, I would be in, in the group, and then right as everybody got to the ring, I would fucking drop down and roll under and slide under the ring and pull the apron skirt down over me, right? And the people would see that. And then the battle royal would be going on, and they would be screaming at Cornette's under the ring, Cornette's under the ring, but finally they'd get involved, and then they would forget about They wouldn't forget about me, but they'd forget about yelling about it. And I'd I'd look at people's feet. And see and count who was – and then finally when I knew there was supposed to be like two or three heels left with the baby face, then I would come out. Now we got the numbers advantage, and I would be, okay, and I'd stand back in the corner, maybe take a shot or two, and the, but then suddenly the baby face would do some fucking Hail Mary where he'd double clothesline both the heels over the top rope and eliminate them, and then it would be me and him. Oh, my God. And then they'd chuck me and get a big pop. So that was a spot show battle royal. It, it just it, – it greatly depended. A lot of it was loose, but now with the Royal Rumble or anything you see on TV, it's time tighter than Dick's hat band, and it's structured down to who eliminates who, where, and in how long. You brought up the San Francisco Battle Royal. That was an annual tradition. That was an annual drawing card. They did the same thing in Los Angeles at the Olympic Auditorium, and I always felt – you know, back then, you know, growing up as a fan, I feel a little differently now that the Olympic one was clearly much, much bigger, but that's mostly because it got the magazine coverage and those images of Bruno in the middle of the ring or Andre, yeah. those are like some of my favorite images from wrestling from the Olympic Auditorium, just those battle royals and seeing those outsiders in there with all of the regulars. Well, see, that's a lesson in it, that any professional wrestling promoter can learn from, and it doesn't even have to be about battle royals. Wh what they did in Los Angeles and San Francisco was they did bring in outside stars. They did build to it all year. They made a big deal out of it. They made the prize money legitimate by saying there, if there's 22 guys, each one of them is going to chip in, you know, a thousand of $500 and we're going to match it or whatever. So the winner gets 20 something thousand dollars, which was huge money at that time, but still believable because, okay, if you pay an entrance fee for this thing, there's 20 something guys in it, blah, blah, blah. They had injuries that came out of it where guys would get thrown over the top rope and land on the concrete and they'd be out for weeks and they'd be talked about as being injured in the battle royal. Uh, they'd have partners turn on partners or friends turn on friends or controversy in the thing over who was going to win it. And and like you said, especially in Los Angeles, one year they bring in Bruno Sammartino just to win the battle royal. The next Andre the Giant wins the. It was always a major superstar. Or in San Francisco, it was always the hottest angle of Roy Shires's year. So that was made to be important. In some other places, and Tennessee being one, battle royals were thrown on the fucking card because just like plus extra special because you didn't have to pay the guys to work again in a battle royal. 
make the card look bigger, puff it out. You know, the managers in the battle royal, whatever, they just prostituted it. So and and they did it so often that it meant nothing. If a if a match of any kind was presented often and not made to be important and didn't feature the top stars of the company, then pretty soon it was that prostituting it pretty soon it didn't draw and it didn't mean anything. I learned this with the blindfold battle royal, which we've told this story before, but for for Nick Goulas back in the old days in Tennessee. It was a spot show match as kind of an attraction for when you went to the high schools and the kids were there. Hey, there's 12 guys in the ring and they're all going to wear black hoods over their heads. So they're blindfolded and they can't see. And the last man in the ring is the winner. And they even allowed pinfalls because who wanted to go over the top rope when you were blindfolded, right? But you could see through the fucking things. But it was just, it was a goof match that was kind of fun for spot shows. Well, then Dundee goes down to book for Bill Watts, and that's one of the things he mentioned. And at first, Watts says, well, fuck, Jesus, that's bullshit. But then wait a minute. And so the way Bill Watts presents it is as a main event, just uh, one, two weeks around the, the, the circuit, which was hitting every major town once. The main event, an 18-man blindfold battle royal. Can you imagine what's going to happen, folks, when 18 of these 250-pound men blindfolded and can't see fighting in the ring, trying to throw each other over the top rope to win a $12,000 prize or whatever the fuck it was? Can you imagine the chaos? People are going to be killed. That's the way it was presented. And the fucking thing grew one time. It, it, it's all in how you present any match who's in it and how you talk about it as to how the people perceive it. How did Dory Funk Sr. get the Texas death match over? He didn't have a Texas death match with no rules, the ultimate fight to see who the toughest man is, and then have a goddamn bullshit finish or have the heel fuck the baby face or just make it silly and do silly spots in it. He did a fucking match where they went two hours and both went to the hospital afterwards from blood loss. And then everybody was there that night, told everybody they fucking knew. And the next time they did a Texas death match, same thing. Have somebody got hard weighed and they called an ambulance and there was chaos. People were throwing chairs and, and they got the match over by what they did with it and how they talked about it and who they put in it. And you can do the same thing today, even if everybody does think that everything's silly and hokey. If you... Talk about something as something that the top stars seriously want to be involved in and want to win, and you put the top stars in it, and you don't weigh it down with silly, ridiculous bells and whistles, the people will take it seriously, and you can get that kind of match over. And if you don't fuck them around on the finish and, and, or, or go back on the stipulation within a week, but if you don't do all those things and people just think, well, it's more of this goddamn hokey ass fucking blindfold battle royal shit. I want to remind you, Saturday, March 30th, 1974 at Olympia Stadium, the opening match, a gigantic 20 man battle royal. <laughs> well, and there you go. There you go. The and match. that's the, because they were in a promotional war and they were hot shotting and kids. What happens when you hot shot too long? You burn out. And two years later, I, I guarantee you that night, I bet you the Sheik had fucking nine or 10,000 people in the Kobo. And I, but two years later, I bet you didn't have 3,000. 